Uh, I get a lot of questions about uh, dials on watches. What appeals to you? What doesn't appeal to you? How are they made? So let's try to touch base on a few techniques and materials used in dial manufacture. We're making a dial. We start with a blank of steel, aluminum, titanium, gold, whatever kind of material you want. You have a, a sheet. Uh, you know your dimensions. You make a. You have a tool to actually stamp these dies out or to stamp these dials out. You'll come down. You'll stamp it. You'll have a perfect disc. You'll have the holes in it that you need. And then next thing you have to do is you actually have to attach it to the movement. You, how do you attach it to the movement with dial feet? You have two little pins that are attached to the bottom side of the dial and they're actually soldered or welded to the dial itself. Those will actually plug into the movement and that secures the dial to the movement. So when you're looking at a watch, you see that dial, the dial's not held in by the case or anything, the dial's actually firmly attached to the movement. Once you have that dial blank, you could do whatever you want to it. You can layer it with different materials, leather, linen, um, denim, or you could take and actually, if the dial's thick enough, you can actually guilloche it, do a design into it, do a tapestry dial, you could stamp it. So that, that's the basics of how a dial is made. Once you have that blank, you could take it anywhere from there. If the dial's gonna be painted, it's either gonna be made out of uh, solid brass, it's gonna be steel, uh, it's gonna be anything that's gonna withstand the finish that's gonna be on it. Because what you don't want is the dial to be flexing. You want it to hold the finish that's gonna be on it. Another way to make a dial is to make a transparent dial. Either a skeleton dial or using a piece of sapphire. Uh, Richard Mill, Hublot, very big on using sapphire dials. Um, it shows you the movement underneath. It shows you the movement workings underneath, which is a very cool effect. Some of the problems with them are they are so unbelievably thin and fragile. If you look at them the wrong way, they crack. And uh, having worked for Hublot, I know that firsthand. I've seen uh, Richard Mill dials with actually with fractures in them as well. They are unbelievably thin dials. They're less than half of a millimeter in thickness. And when you talk about something as hard as sapphire, again, the harder you get, the more brittle it is. So they crack very, very easily. But the look you get from them, they're, it's like there's nothing there. And so it shows you the entire movement underneath it. They're very, very cool. We talk about guilloche dials. That's one of the most difficult dials to make. The machine used for that is larger than the area that I'm sitting in. It is a massive machine. And it, what it does, it works off templates and it actually engraves the design into the dials. So you have to start out with a dial that's much thicker and you're actually removing metal. And it's, uh, it's again, it's a, it's a huge, it's a lathe that they use, but it's all hand powered and everything's turned by hand and it's just meticulously made. And it's just different cuts and overlapping cuts that make the design, make the final design in. When we talk about tapestry dials, uh, tapestry dials, uh, AP uses a tapestry dial. Rolex had made a tapestry dial with, it's more of a diamond shape in it, where it's metal removed and uh, in between, and it gives you gives you a different pattern, get more of a square or a diamond pattern depending on what what uh, angle it's on. Omega calls it a teak dial because it has the lines like a teak board. It looks like it looks like the deck of a ship. So that, that's where the, the different names come from. Again, it's all different styles. And what I always say is, you know, always buy something that really, really resonates with you and your personality. Another idea for dials is, and one of my favorites is actually porcelain dials. Because when you look at them, they have defects in them. Uh, we have people all the time, they look at their porcelain dials and they'll say, well, there's spots in it. Well, there's going to be because it's it's actual baked finish. So you start off with metal, you put the porcelain on it, it's fired. And it's so it's going to have an uneven finish. It's going to have imperfections in it. And that's part of the character because it's a fingerprint. No two are alike. So to me, porcelain dials are some of the most beautiful dials they are, but they're also some of the most fragile dials there are because once they start to crack, they crack. Another material when we talk about that, and we talk, this also fits into the guilloche and the porcelain, are mother of pearl dials. And mother of pearl dials are just what they say. They come from the mother of pearl. It is such a thin layer of, of veneer that they put on top of the metal. A lot of times you'll see them guilloche. Uh, Langa does a nice, beautiful guilloche mother of pearl dial that just has amazing depth to it. But it is so thin and they're so unbelievably fragile. The joke is if you look at it the wrong way, they'll crack in front of your eyes. They're gorgeous, gorgeous dials. Meteorite dials are, are among my favorites. One of the interesting facts about the meteorite dial is all meteorite dials came from the same meteorite. The way a meteorite is constructed, it's different serrations of basically metal. 
so they, they, the angles constantly change. When you have regular metal, metal's rolled out. So it's either metal's either cast or rolled. And you, you roll the metal out, so the grain of the metal all goes one direction. So it's almost like uh, your finger is laying across. When you have a meteorite, it just changes direction all the time. So when they slice that off, you never know what it's going to look like. And to me personally, Rolex has the prettiest meteorite dials just because of the cut. Uh, I don't know what they do different in the cut than everybody else, but it just it shows so many more angles than everybody else. So the Rolex meteor dials, in my, my estimation, are the prettiest and probably followed by JLC. Uh, sector dials were used by uh, either Zodiac. Uh, Laurent Ferrier has uh, some Zodiac dials. We talk about a sector of crosshair dials. Um, that's one of, a, one of an interesting thing, and I don't know how many people have actually uh, studied or know about um, the, the Zodiac, and both the Zodiac Killer and the Zodiac Watch, because the symbol for that was actually the crosshair. And it was believed that, even though they never caught him, that he actually took his symbol from a Zodiac Watch. So it's the sector of the watch, and actually it just divides it like a crosshair. And it's, it's not used very common. It's more of a, I don't want to call it an art deco, but it is a style. Applied dials. And then we talk about an applied dial, we're, we're gonna start with the base metal, and whether or not we're putting a piece of leather on top of it or putting a piece of uh, fabric on top of it, those are, it's gonna be basically a veneer, a very thin layer on top of the base. So you have the base that's gonna hold everything solid, and then you have, you apply something, you apply fabric onto it you, with a texture to it. You apply um, uh, a leather that's already tooled. And uh, those are actually uh, some of the coolest, coolest dials I've seen are the leather dials. They have to be so thin. Rolex, years ago, used to make a uh, wood burl dial, and which was very cool. A wood burl is actually a knot that grows inside the wood. It's a branch that never may turn itself into a branch. So the grain of the wood just turned itself into little knots. And so when you cut it, when you slice it across, it looks like little circles, a bunch of little circles. And you could take that and cross slide it and then get a veneer out of it and make a dial out of that. And Rolex did that for a while and they put them on uh, the day dates with bark dials. We talk about different, different stones. Uh, we mentioned mother of pearl, but the, some of the other ones, lapis. They've made dials out of lapis, um, which are some of the prettiest dials you'll see. They have uh, there's the deepest blue color you can imagine. Yeah, it's just, uh, so you can make a dial pretty much out of anything. I've personally made dials out of shipwreck coins. And when you start with a shipwreck coin, they were, uh, the, the fault of that, of making a dial of a shipwreck coin is you actually destroy the coin to making it because you have to remove so much metal. You start out with something that's that's three to four millimeters thick because you have an ounce of silver and you have to actually mill that down to less than a millimeter. The problem is with a shipwreck coin, when the coins were made back in the 1700s, 1600s, they're stamped coins and there's actually voids in the metal. So you're actually machining metal off of it and if you hit one of those voids, the coin can actually explode. So you have to be very, very careful as you're tearing everything down to get to that paper thin level because a millimeter thick Piece of, piece of silver is very, very fragile. So you have to remove everything. I did come up with another process of not being it, not having to destroy the coin to make it. And uh, it's something I've been using lately. Enamel dials are, are interesting because enamel dials are hand painted. Everything's painted on the watch. And what they do is they, they do multiple firings for enamel dials. So you can start out with either a very dark color and then add, add color to it and you fire it in between. And every time you fire it, they fuse together. So you actually end up with depth, and you can end up with the most beautiful painting that's enamel and it's permanent. A Laurent Ferrier uh, World Time is, a, is, a, is an enamel dial, and when you look at it, you just see so much depth in it, and it's because there is depth. It's just layer on top of layer on top of layer. So if you don't like something, you can actually add to it, or you add to it to add that depth. We also, one of the big concerns we have as watchmakers are how to treat vintage dials. We treat vintage dials, vintage hands, completely different. Uh, when, when the dial comes off, extra care is taken so there's no further deterioration of those dials or hands. Uh, we'll seal the hands so they stay in the condition they are with crack luminous. It doesn't matter. We don't want to change that luminous because we want that, those hands to match that dial. We want the colors to be correct. Antique dials now, it's all the rage. Uh, if your dial has defects in it, they want that. If you have a Rolex with a color change dial, a dial that used to be black and is now brown, it, the watch is actually worth more money. You have a Submariner, two-tone Submariner that started out life as blue and now it's purple. People want that purple dial. 
The reason is, at some point in its life, and when that dial first started changing, people wanted it put back to a blue dial so the dial would be changed. You would send the watch to Rolex, you would send it to a Rolex watchmaker, they would swap that dial out, dials were on exchange, they would change it, put the new dial on, that didn't change colors. So it's gonna be interesting to see 20, 30 years from now, how the dials made today, how they are aging compared to the dials that were made 20, 30 years ago. We talked a little bit today about dials, manufacturing materials, uh, exactly how they're made, functions, how to preserve them. If you have any more questions, hit my Instagram. Thank you for watching and I hope you liked this video. If you did, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more content like it.